the sky above Praxis Free, was burning. In the void of the desert world's near orbit, two great fleets battered against each other with the reckless hate and fury only longtime foes could muster. Those unlucky enough to be on the planet's surface could only watch the carnage play out in stupefied awe and horror, but those with cooler heads were wise enough to run for the burning debris of the battle was already raining down like a devastating meteor shower. Yet there was no safety or sanctuary for the hapless people of Praxis Free. There was no outrunning a cataclysm of such colossal scale. It had been millennia since the capital world of the Praxian hegemony had seen war on its doorstep, and its leaders, in their arrogance, had been confident no such measures would ever be needed. They were wrong. And now Praxis Free, and every one of its billions of inhabitants, was paying the price for their hubris. The light of Praxis Free's primary was outshone by the brilliance of dozens of simultaneous impact flares. Its tectonic plates heaved and buckled. Vast swarms of its ancient megacities were instantly laid waste. Millions of Praxians were turned to dust that choked the survivors as they screamed. High above their heads, the remnants of the Praxian Hegemony's Grand Fleet shared their fate. Admiral Shulvov Nakar, seated in his command chair, watched helplessly as one of the enemy vessels lashed out with one of the downable lance beams mounted on his prow. His foes had fitted their ships with numerous new weapons that matched or even outmatched their Praxian equivalents, but those beam weapons, whatever they were, had proven to be the bane of the Praxian capital ships. The bright red energy beam was too bright for his six eyes to look at directly, and it was powerful enough to drain as much as 75% of a ship's energy shielding in a single hit. His own flagship, the Nariss Lock, had learned that, to its sorrow, at the Battle of the Binary several solar weeks before. Nakar's facial tendrils twitched as he remembered the sorrow of that day. The enemy had been pushing deep into Praxian territory for more than five years now, and they had done so with astonishing tenacity. Those early battles had been the costliest for the invaders. In capturing the Praxian Hegemony's fringe worlds and establishing a firm foothold in Praxian space, the Hu Gan, as his people call the vermin, had suffered casualty rates that would have cost a Praxian his head. But the Hu Gan either bred like space and movers, or simply didn't care about the numbers of their own dead because no matter how many ships and soldiers they'd lost, they did not stop. They did not stop at Divizar, where the Hugan had attempted to capture the orbital shipyards there. Three times they'd attacked, and three times the planet's layers of heavy defence batteries and defence fleets had driven them back. But the fourth time the Hugan came, they came with a different objective altogether. Rather than smashing their fleets against Davizar's fortifications, they had loaded up one of their capital ships, a heavy cruiser of some kind, larger than any Hugan ship the Praxians had encountered up until that point, with high-grade explosives, overloaded its engines, and threw it at the defenders. The ship's layers of metal armour and energy shielding had quickly given way under the Praxian guns, for even a ship of such colossal size could not last long under such a punishing rain of fire. It was but one vessel, and the Praxians had been many. It had not mattered. The ship had survived just long enough to slam into the shipyards that encircled Davizar like metal rings. Then his shields failed, and it exploded with such violent force that it annihilated not just the shipyards, but dozens of Praxian naval vessels too. Davizar had fallen, Less than a solar day later, and at a stroke, the Praxian hegemony lost more than a quarter of its overall shipbuilding capabilities. A bitter blow, but one softened with the knowledge that at least the enemy had been denied those capabilities as well. The damage done by the Hugan apes was irreparable. Or at least that's what the Lord Admirals of the Navy had thought. Right up until Praxian intelligence had informed them that the Hugan had not only repaired the shipyards, but increased their total output by more than 20%. Nakar had been in the room when the War Council had read the news, and felt his own mind reel at the terrible implications of it. 
How could the primitive savages have repaired so much damage in so little time? From there, the war had only gone from bad to worse. The Hugan had moved quickly, and soon reports of enemy battle groups were coming in from every corner of Praxian space. The all-rich worlds of the Cronus Cluster had been seized after six days of bitter fighting. The agro worlds of the Jazari Sector, breadbasket of the Hegenemy's outer territories, were captured. Few Praxian vessels had escaped, but those that did brought back ominous reports of the Hugen armies overrunning world after world like a horde of vicious insects. Worse still, they spread their tainted creed like a plague. On each world the Hugen captured, they liberated the Praxian Hegemony's conquered slave races from their proper place of bondage. They filled the heads of these inferior species with ludicrous promises of equality and opportunity. And within a year, many of these so-called freed peoples had taken up arms against their rightful masters. Insectoid Calixians, and mammalian Endovites, and even the four-armed Urglock had all been observed wearing Hugen uniforms, fighting in Hugen armies, and serving on Hugen ships. Nakar gritted his teeth first as the wrist lock shuddered beneath him. The arrogance, he muttered. The arrogance! How did it come to this? He knew the answer to that, of course. It had come to this because the Praxians had tried to annex the Hugen homeworld, and much of its surrounding solar system shortly after the Hugen had achieved hyperspace capability. It had been a close-run thing too, and it could have been wrapped in weeks if the Lord Admirals had simply taken his advice and blasted that miserable blue marble from orbit, rather than letting themselves be sucked into a grueling war against Hugen guerrilla forces. Their cities had been destroyed, and their armies shattered, but the Hugen had not accepted the reality of their defeat. It had taken decades, but the Praxians had eventually decided that Hugen planet wasn't worth the effort it took to tie it down. So the Praxian hegemony had simply withdrawn its forces, confident that the devastation they'd wrought would prove impossible to overcome, and the surviving Hugen would eventually succumb to a long, slow extinction. They had been wrong. The Hugen refused to die. They had banded together to survive and rebuild their planet. They unified under a single government for the first time in their history. They scavenged Praxian wreckage to create primitive starships and unlock new and marvellous technologies that allowed them to rebuild their shattered home in only a few hundred years. Then the Hugan began to spread outward. They terraformed Mars. They founded colonies on Venus. They built shipyards at Uranus and Neptune. They even signed diplomatic accords with some of their closest galactic neighbours. They did all these things and more, but they never forgot the Praxians. Now, in the skies above the ancestral homeworld of the Praxian race, the Hugan took their vengeance. The fleet now assaulting the heart of Praxian civilization was so vast, it seemed to blot out the very light of the stars. Sensor arrays became so crowded with the energy signatures of Hugan vessels that their cogitator cores overloaded and crashed. The Praxians were hopelessly outnumbered, and with the rest of their empire fallen to the Hugan, there was nowhere left for their forces to run. The Hugan fleet did not answer any hails as they came within firing range. They did not open any communications. They did not give any demands for surrender. Instead, swarms of fighter craft spewed from Hugan carriers like wasps from a ruptured hive. Turbo cannons locked on target. Laser batteries swiveled silently. Then the two forces came together, and the void began to burn. Light cruisers and starfighter carriers fought in the shadow of larger vessels, darting in all directions like schools of remora in the lee of sharks. Flights of starfighters tore each other pieces. Energy weapons and volleys of laser fire pulsed, staining the stars with vibrant bursts of red, blue and green. But the Praxians were outnumbered. More, they were outclassed. The Hukan had turned out dozens of new types of warships, each of greater potency, and the Praxian ships could not stand up to them. Not anymore. Nakar gripped his command chairs tightly as battle reports streamed into the wrist lock's bridge. Each one was worse than the last. Dragon Zero reports shields are 55%, sir, someone called out. They've lost two of their escort cruisers and one of their primary engines is offline. 
Vagas train has been destroyed. No escape was detected, said another. Battleship Brazak reports six enemy cruisers entering Battlesphere, moving to engage. Nakar got to his feet. Order Brazak into a defensive position and shore up our left flank. All auxiliary power to shields and forward cannons. His mottled skin was pink with stress, and he wiped perspiration from his brow with one of his free fingered hands. We can't allow ourselves to be outflanked. That had happened before a Zondar, and the results had been catastrophic. Six entire battle fleets destroyed the last ship. He opened his mouth to give further orders, but the words died before unspoken. Something slammed into the wrist lock hard enough to knock the Admiral off his feet. It hit the side of his command chair as he fell, cursing both the impact and the cold eye that began to run down one side of his face. We're hit, one of the technicians said. I know that, you idiot, the car screamed. Damage report! We hit him in ships, the tech replied. Gun batteries 5, 6, 7 and 12 have been destroyed. Critical damage to deck 6 through 10. Shields at 45%. What hit us? How close is it? I don't know, the tech cried. Our forward center arrays have been destroyed. We're blind to anything that's not coming up from the rear. Evasive action, the Admiral ordered. Hard to port and get us beyond the range of those capital ships. All remaining batteries focus fire on the Hugan troop ships and escort vessels. Signal to... The car's voice failed him, as he looked out into space and saw bits of wreckage begin tumbling past the bridge's viewport. He knew each ship in the fleet, like the back of his own appendages. The wreckage belonged to the Brazak, or what was left of it. Nakar opened his mouth to curse the Hugan, and the bridge erupted in fire. Seen from the void, his once proud vessel stopped dead in space as explosions ripped through its starboard hull. Wreckage, and the tiny bodies of its crew vented out into space. His engine sputtered and died. It was a majestic looking vessel, even in its ruin, but it was utterly dwarfed by the ship that was about to kill it. The glory of terror, flagship of the Terran Confederacy, was a terrifying sight to the Praxians, and a symbol of pride for those who fought alongside it. So great was its bulk that it dwarfed even the greatest Praxian battleships, and so great was its firepower that it could raise a world in less than a day. It had been built in utter secrecy, and even more terrifying than its size and destructive capability was the fact that, to the Praxians, it had seemed to come from nowhere thanks to the experimental stealth technology built into its hull. It had been held back from the battle, waiting for the right moment to reveal itself. That moment had come, and now it cast its cloak aside and stormed, guns blazing into the fray. It ploughed through the Praxian ships like a juggernaut, firing at every vessel within targeting range, and leaving only wreckage in its titanic wake. Heavy cruisers were shredded, battleships torn asunder, lighter vessels atomized in seconds. Entire squadrons of Praxian starfighters were reduced to ash. As it laid waste all about it, the narrow prow of Gloria's diamond-shaped hull struck the Nerys lock amidships and ripped the crippled vessel in two. Its stern half careened off into space, but its bow section crashed into another Praxian ship, destroying them both. The glory of terror did not suffer so much as a scratch, and it was, one might argue, a bitter mercy that Admiral Dakar did not live to see the carnage it inflicted on the tattered remains of his fleet. The Battle of Praxis Free had devolved from pitch battle to target practice. And the glory to terror, as a new addition to the Confederacy's fleet, needed all the practice it could get. Minutes later, every Praxian vessel in orbit had been destroyed, and the glory of terror's shields were still at 95%. The Dreadnought's bridge echoed to the cheers of its crew, and even its commander. Admiral Benjamin Blake couldn't help the smile that tugged at the corner of his mouth. Still, the work was not yet done. The Confederacy had achieved voice superiority, but Praxis Free itself remained unconquered. Not for long, he thought grimly, clasping his hands behind his back. Blake took a moment to gather himself, took a deep breath, and then issued the order he had waited years to give. 
Voice superiority has been achieved. Justice has come to praxis free. Justice for humanity, and justice for those long held in frail beneath its iron heel. The hour has finally come. To your duty, sons and daughters of terror. All hands. All hands. Operation Retribution begins now. Troop transports begin landing under fighter cover at pre-assigned coordinates. Commence orbital invasion. <laughs>